I wanted to know, did you ever have a friend growing up who had all the toys? Anyone could relate and look back and, and they had all the toys. Anyone relate to this experience? I remember hanging out with a kid where, where I would have one video game. He had ten. And he had the Nintendo Genie, which if you were growing up, that was awesome. Um, I had this kind of bike and my tire was wobbly. We couldn't even get paid for it to get fixed because it hit a curb once. He had the new Dino BMX. You know, it was sweet. It was awesome. And, and uh, I remember one time I was driving over to this friend's house and there I saw their, their new family purchase. And I saw at this time this, uh, I'll bring it up to you now. Ah. And I remember thinking, that is a beautiful truck. The Ford F-150. I remember thinking as a child, that is awesomeness wrapped in metal, right? And I was just, man, I was blown away. And I was in the car, and I was riding with um, his mom um, on the way, and I saw this, and I, and I complimented them, like, that is an awesome car. Congratulations, guys. You know, this, this is really cool. Well, she, wiser than I, was picked up, picking up on how I was feeling. And, and she looked at me, and, and she said something that I wasn't expecting. And she said, well... Do you know, Dustin, that you too are, are rich? And I paused, and, and yeah, I was kind of impressed with what she had. Rich, I'm like, if you would see our station wagon, I mean, the ceiling is caving in. The sky is literally falling in our car right now. Um, I would say that in comparison, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say those words. But she went on to say, and she said, no, so you're rich because your dad's a pastor. You see, she went to the same church we did at St. Stephen's Beaver Dam, and, and she said, you are rich when it comes to faith and what God is doing. She taught me a very valuable lesson that day. And she redefined what rich meant. See, rich wasn't just about stuff. You could be rich in other ways. And she identified that, that I had riches in the Lord. And she said, I, I too am a, a wealthy person in God's point of view. Well, just as she redefined that word rich, that's what we're going to be doing in this series. We're going to take a look at a few different words. We're going to take a look at blessed, at greatness, and love. And we're going to see God's definitions on what it is to be those things. And here's a goal for our time together. It's this. To see the world the way God sees it. To have a perspective that's a bit higher than everyone else. And that way our lives might be redefined by his definitions. That we could have new experiences and see it as God sees it. So with that, we're talking about blessed, and um, you have your cards here, okay? Does anyone have these cards? Um, this is in the spirit of Fogo de Chao. Anyone been to that Brazilian restaurant? Uh, everyone knows that if you've been there, you hold up green for more, which is obviously good. You hold up red if you don't want any right now. Well, we are going to get in the spirit of Fogo de Chao, and we're going to vote. I was watching the All-Star Games, and they, they vote for, like, dunks and all that kind of stuff. And, and I thought we would experience this. And I'm going to have some pictures for you, some scenarios. And I want you to vote with me on whether this is blessed or not blessed. Now, if you're a Christian, I want you to hold your Christianity and your spiritual view right now. I just want to talk about in an earthly sense for this. Okay, so we're going to apply this from an earthly sense. Are they blessed or are they not blessed? Are you guys ready? Got your cards? Raise up your cards just so I can see them. Perfect. Thank you, thank you. This goes so much better when you're back and forth. I love it. All right, so here we go. First exercise, we have Super Bowl winners. What do we say? <laughs> Not everyone's agreed, but okay. And, uh, and then we got these guys, right? Okay, yeah. Okay. They got there, so that's in some ways a good thing. Uh, what about this? The, the French skiing team, they, they won all of it. it uh, bronze, silver, and gold uh, for one ski event. They just won the whole thing. And then what about this guy in yellow? What would you say about him? What would you say? See, that's actually a trick, but... Because you know he's actually this guy on the podium. So you got, you got to pay attention, guys. Come on. Come on. He's still blessed. All right? <sighs> Stay in this. What about this? All right? Okay. And this. I'm preparing. Not good. Um, what about this? I like that. What about this? Maybe you're blessed not to work for him. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. That hair's weird. All right, uh, going on. This is mine. Yes, the neon orange Porsche. Woo! Someday. All right. And then if you had an orange Pinto. <laughs> not quite the same. Not, 
not a good car. The movie Cars, you know, those, those Pintos never lasted. So. so we are familiar, and you did a wonderful job, right? We get what blessed is. In fact, when, when Super Bowl winners win, Russell Wilson will use the word, I, I feel blessed, right? And, and when you win the Oscar and the guy stands up there, the girl stands up there, they say, I'm blessed. And yet that term is usually not used in the Denver locker room. That term is usually not used when it comes to those who didn't win the Oscar, right? Well, we got to see blessed for what it is today. All right, and so we have an earthly vantage point, but we need to see Jesus' view of things. So, so let's get into it. The words before us, man, am I excited about this series. And part of my excitement for this series, are these are the very words of Jesus. And these are the words of Jesus in the longest sermon ever recorded in the Bible for us. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I actually had a chance to visit where he preached this sermon in Israel. They have a church dedicated to it. This is a tangent, but if you want to go to Israel and, and want to travel there, my father's leading a trip and there's information on the info booth. You can actually go to the place where, where they say he preached this sermon. This sermon is a great sermon, and it's much about how to live for the Lord. We call that sanctification if you're a church person. And we're going to get into what it is to be blessed. So without further ado, let's read Matthew chapter 5. Uh, some call this the Beatitudes based on how we are blessed. And reading from, from there, verse 1. It says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you, when they falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because of great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, dear friends, as we from an earthly standpoint look at this and we say poor in spirit, mourning those who are persecuted, we would say, uh uh-uh, God, it's... I'm feeling, but he holds up this card, doesn't he? And that's what we get to explore. Your takeaway for today, if you take nothing else away from the message, is this. That you can be both blessed and broken at the same time. And that's the truth we get to explore today. So let's get into it. We welcome everyone here. Uh, Man, is it great to gather. And um, I'm going to talk to the Christians really quick here. Um, But if you're not a Christian, we're so glad you made it. If you have questions about Jesus, you came to the right place. We're just so glad you're here. But if you're a Christian, one of the hardest questions that you get, and it's a question that have turned some Christians actually away from God, is a question I'm going to put before you, okay? It's this question, and people, again, have turned from God. Maybe, Maybe, again, this has bothered you at one point or another, this very question. It's this. If there is a good God, why is there so much suffering? And there are variations of the question. Has anyone heard this before? If there is a good God, why is there so much suffering? Because it calls into question, if there is suffering, well then God must not be that loving, he must not be that good, or he must not be that powerful because he doesn't stop it or he's not powerful enough to stop it. I had a chance this past week to see a great answer to this question. Um, It's a movie that I'd recommend uh, with Kirk Cameron. Uh, It's called Unstoppable. Anyone hear of this movie? Okay, it's worth an hour. Uh, it's, It's a good answer. And I love what Kirk Cameron did when answering this question. This whole movie was about it. He took everything back to the beginning. He took it back to the way the world was with the first man and the first woman. Now, when God made everything, it was perfect. It was holy. It was in harmony. There would be no suffering. There would be no chaos. But because of that first man and that first woman, it destroyed the way things are. In fact, if you know this lesson, can anyone say in a word what caused brokenness? In a word that starts with S, what brought all of this suffering? Sin. Sin. And so a better question is to take God out of it, by the way, and just ask, why is there suffering? Well, sin. God had nothing to do with that. He did not force Adam and Eve, nor does he tempt anyone to sin. And yet sin came into the world. But why this movie is great, because it went on and explained, in spite of sin, in spite of brokenness, in spite of badness, guess what God can do? 
He can work even those bad things for good. That's how good he is. He didn't cause the bad, but he'll work with the bad. He'll work with anything you're given. And he'll use his almighty love and his goodness, and he'll work it for good. That's our God. And that's what we're considering today. In fact, to understand what it is to be blessed, I also want to talk about family life. Um, I want to talk what it is when our toddlers are hurting or crying. Okay, so get your mind wrapped around the toddler world, ages two through five, if they are hurt or if they are afraid. This past week, uh, Nadia came to the dinner table and she had informed us that her lip had just fell off. Now, thankfully, she is still okay. Um, her lip did not actually fall off. She had a bit of skin that fell off and, and, and that's all it was. But she had felt, my whole lip is now gone. Uh-oh, what do I do? Well, she was really concerned about this. And so, because she was a little afraid, a little scared, you know, the, the lip came off, she had to rush over to, not dad, to mom. And mom needed to hold her, right? Mom needed to comfort her. She wanted to be held only by mom and to hear mom say, you know what, honey, it's going to be okay. Your, your lip is still there. You look okay. It's going to work out. You're going to be all right. Now, if you've ever had a toddler, when they are hurt or when they are afraid, what do they do? Isn't it the same reaction? They run to, usually mom, dad will do in a pinch, and they need to be held, even though they scrape their knees, their legs are not broken because they use those little legs and they come with tears and they, they grab onto us. And they let us hold them. And let us whisper into their ears, it's going to be okay. I love you. It's all right. Now we, we have a lot of instances where we have pain. A lot of instances where we feel like this. We have circumstances that don't go our way. I wanted this, I didn't get it. I loved him or her, and they're not there. This is my day-to-day -day walk, and this is my skill base and my energy base, and I don't feel up to it. And so often, you just go around asking why and, and what, and man, this doesn't feel good. But what if we redefined it? What if we saw from a different vantage point what God is doing us? What if whenever tragedy hit or we were suffering, we asked this question or we saw this, that God doesn't hate you, but he may just want to hold you. You see, God can use that circumstance to draw you back into his arms and to whisper into your ears, you know what, I love you. He can show up with a tenderness you couldn't imagine and say, I got this. He can show up and say, I'm going to never leave you and never forsake you and you are mine and it's going to be okay for I know the plans I have for you. And he gets to hold you at that time. And as a pastor, I would love to tell you that we all run to God when things are good, when stocks are high and things go according to plan and it all works out. But I would tell you the opposite happens, doesn't it? We come rushing back to our Father when we are hurting, when we need something, when we're afraid. And He holds us. And He says, you don't have to fear. And He says, I love you. And He works in spite of it. That's a good God. And so we read. What's it say? Verses 3 and 4. Blessed. Blessed are you, though you're poor in spirit, if you're discouraged, if you feel down and out, if you feel like the world is caving in. Blessed are you, for you get the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for guess what? You're going to be comforted. You see, I want you to know that if you're here only to let God hold you, if you're here because of a circumstance and you know you need something, well then the scripture only says one thing about your circumstance. If he is holding you right now, you are blessed to know him. And you are blessed to have him. And you are blessed to get to hear, I love you and it's going to be okay. That was a story Jesus told, wasn't it? We looked at the words of our second lesson and he told the whole story, the parable of the rich man and poor Lazarus. And we see the dichotomy. We see the rich man who had every earthly good thing. Now, it's not bad to have earthly goods, but it was bad because he didn't have God. 
And God looks at that situation and he looks at us and he says, if you have everything in this world and you do not have me, here's my perspective. If you have everything, if all goes according to plan and every need and want is yours and, and you retire in Bora Bora, it, it's still, if you don't have me. But then there's Lazarus, who in this earthly life didn't have much. Dogs were his friends and he wanted to eat Alpo. He wanted dog food. That, that's how hungry he was. And God says, even in that life and in the next, there was only this. Because I got to hold him. I got to be his God in this life. And he is with me. In fact, would you look back at the second lesson? Verse 25, it says, we see this dichotomy. Abraham replied, son, remember in this lifetime, you received your good things. And Lazarus received bad things. But now, he's comforted. I want you to know, if you follow Jesus... If you love him with all your heart, if he is your savior, there is an expiration date to your suffering. It cannot last forever. And that was Lazarus' story. It will change. The circumstances will end, but your joy will never end. If you're in Jesus Christ, your, your sadness, your suffering, it will end, but your joy goes on forever and ever. And there is a man named Lazarus who says that. Because I am with the Lord being comforted. That is a good God. But we soldier on. Let's learn some more. This is fun. I was watching the Olympics this past week, and I, I heard the story of uh, this lady, Sarah Burke. Uh, anyone hear the, the story of Sarah Burke? A few, a few. Well, let me tell you the story. Sarah was a pioneer in a new event. It was the Half Pipe for Women Skiing. And here she is. She won four Winter X Games, winning gold in that event. And because she loved the event, she was so good at it, uh, she, she lobbied for the Olympic Committee to add this event to the Olympics. And so in 2014 in the Sochi Olympics, it actually is the new event. She has changed the course of the Olympic Games, and, and there is now women's half pipe. The unfortunate thing is Sarah Burke will not be performing. You see, if you know the, the story, two years earlier, uh, through a regular just uh, trial run through practicing, she fell and she hit her head in Utah. And it seemed fair enough, seemed like a fall like anything else, but shortly thereafter, she had cardiac arrest. And after that, rushed to the hospital. And it's in the hospital where she lost her life. So even though she would have been a gold favorite uh, to win that medal, she will not be competing based on what happened. Well, look at her story. And I see all the work she, she put in to, to change the course of the Olympic Games, all the practice she must have put in to win those X Games medals. And, and I, I come to this general truth about life. And that is this. That nothing significant happens without sacrifice. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Nothing significant in this life will happen without hard work. We see that with Olympians in general. They are not there because it was easy to get there. They are there because of sacrifice. Their time, their energy went into this or that. With professional athletes. We know this as parents. If you have a child and you want to be a parent in a good way, you're going to have to sacrifice different things. Your own will, your own money, it's all going to go in different avenues, right? Uh, we, we see this at work. If I really want to excel at work, I got to sacrifice, be dedicated, put in that hard work for that to go well. In all different reasons, as a student, whatever, we got to put in the sacrifice. Do you know Jesus says the same to you if you're a Christian? I think that's the words of today. Much of what he's talking about is a warning. Much of this section is saying, if you're going to follow me, watch out. There's sacrifice. Look at verses 10 through 12 with me. He says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you, and falsely say all things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so Jesus is saying, if you follow me, guess what? Not everyone's going to want to date you. If you love me with all your heart, guess what? Not everyone's going to hire you. In fact, they might just fire you for trying to do my will in your location. If you love me, they might even make fun of you and call you names. They might persecute you. They might not invite you to the party. 
And for us, this, this strikes us really weird. It's like when our parents tell us to do something and we suffer for it. Like, I, I tried to follow you, Lord, and, and I get this? Lord, Lord, I tried to live for you today in my job and I got made fun of? Lord, what, what is going on? Lord, Lord, you, you can see my heart. Why, why aren't you working things out? Why aren't you moving heaven and earth so that when I do your will, it, it works out like I want it to work out, Lord? Lord, I feel this way and I want to give up because I don't see what I'm supposed to see. I'm doing your will, Lord. But we got to turn from that, I think. And I think maybe the reason we're struggling is not because it's not blessed. Maybe just at that point, we are really being used to do something significant. Maybe it's at that point, that struggle, that we're really making a difference, even though it's not easy. Maybe God is just telling you to stick in there. You know, when Jesus sent out his 12 disciples, sent them out to the world, he said, I want to warn you, when you follow me, no student, which is what we are, is above the master. And they treated me a certain way, which to go into it wasn't pleasant. And guess what? As a student, they're going to treat you the same. You got to be ready for that. So we are blessed even though we might be persecuted. We are blessed even though they might have dumped us for being a Christian. Which, by the way, if you're a high schooler and they dump you for being a Christian, they have done you a favor. Okay? And in so many circumstances, if they don't get what you're doing in Christ, that is okay. I need to tell you that this morning. And this principle, isn't this the essence of Jesus Christ and his love for us? We would not be here. We would not be saved. We would not know peace or be the children of God if he did not bear up under persecution. Our Lord Jesus was a man of suffering and familiar with sorrows. This man who would bear up under the ultimate sacrifice of the cross, become obedient to death, even death on the shameful cross, so that you and I could win something tremendously significant. Heaven with our Lord. So you and I would know peace today. The knowledge of forgiveness that is through and through Forgiveness past our doubts. Forgiveness past our failures. Forgiveness past all of that. So you and I could know He's holding us right now. So you and I could know He's going to hold us in heaven. So you and I could know how good He is. But this came through sacrifice. And that man who sacrificed for you, who also was God, He says, guess what? That might happen in your life. In Jesus' words, He says, come follow me. Take up your cross. But there is reward. See, we're not down here. We don't gather here because we don't have reason to celebrate, by the way. We have much joy. You want to see reward? Let's talk about reward. To talk about reward, I, I wanted to bring up a, a place that I came by in the UP of Michigan. I was going to preach um, in, in, in Michigan and pass through the UP, which is an interesting place, to say the least. Um, and there I saw this sign, the mystery spot. Now, that is great advertising in my mind because the very sign makes you ask the question, I wonder what it is. I mean, you, your, your curiosity is peaked forever. In fact, I never even went to the mystery spot, but here I still am wondering the goodness of the mystery spot. I mean, that, that is really good advertising. Uh, 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 man, and have you ever had that where, where you would love to see something? I wonder what that was like, or I wonder what it would be like, or I, if I was only there, you know, I, I wonder how cool that would have been, right? The mystery spot. Well, God says that we have an avenue into something awesome today. An avenue that I believe if they created an amusement park around it, people would pay even thousands of dollars. Okay, and you want to know what this is? He says that you and I today can see something that people have, have longed to see. You know what it is? You and I can see the face of God. You and I can know what He is like. I believe if Disney World set up that as an exhibit in, in one of their parks, people would hand over the money to see God and meet Him for who He is. God says to you today, you don't have to wonder that mystery. See, see you, can, you can see me. And what does it say? What's our pathway? What's the reward of following Jesus and knowing Him? Get into it, verse 9. Blessed are the pure in heart. You hold me above all things. You hold my will above all things. You commit to following me and, and having the blessed life that I describe. Guess what? 
You're going to see God. Great is your reward for following him. When we want to follow his ways and know his will and read our word, we have an understanding of who he is. We get the clarity of the sunshine shining on our life. We see exactly how good he is and what he can do. But dear friends, I want to warn you, every sin that we give into is interference. Every sin, every path away from him will work like clouds blocking the sun. Every time we give our thing over to that, we might ourselves change our view of him because of what we have done. Not that he has changed, but that our perspective has changed based on what we went into. But if you commit to following him, and you say, I'm not going to bear the cost or count it, I'm going to pick up my cross and follow you, so you will know his goodness. That peace which transcends our understanding. Great will be your reward if you content to live under his definitions of what it is to be blessed. So dear friends who have found the arms of a loving father, you are blessed even if today you feel broken. Don't let your feelings lie to you because your God has told you this. You are blessed even if today you are mourning. You are blessed even if today you have legitimate problems because he's holding you. He might even be doing something significant through you. And great is your reward through him. Amen.